and we have some material to cover. My material today is is brief, and it's going to be related to negotiation. Um, you may be surprised we're talking about this in this course, but you, at a deeper level, you you shouldn't be. Um, negotiations are ubiquitous for IT projects, for software development, for entrepreneurship. Negotiations are often commonplace to get a job, um, to start in that job. Um, misconceptions, I find, regarding nature and guidelines for negotiation are just very, very common. There's a lot of crude thinking and negotiation out there, including that spreading out of the White House sometimes um, these days um, by a book that the president of the U.S. didn't write, um, but it has his name on it. Win-win um, agreements uh, are commonly possible because uh, parties, as we'll see, have different preferences. And often it is possible to get an agreement that both parties are very comfortable with. And identifying win-win options is going to turn out to be one of the key skills uh, during negotiations. And it turns out that will be fostered, not hindered, by dealing with multiple attributes, offers, and sharing some information. So it's not a matter of being a battering ram that um, just pushes for one solution, um, you know, your way or the highway, and um, and uh, bullheadedly insists on this and doesn't give out any information, keeps anything cl everything close to the chest. Often, it really helps to give out certain types of information, not always. It helps to listen to what the other party is seeking, and it helps to think creatively about how they can win as well, okay? Um, so, you know, in software, we, we do have very common negotiations needed, working out compromises within the Iron Triangle. You have a, a, a potential client who comes to you and they want you to build this software with these features within this time for this price. Um, and you may need to argue that the price needs to be higher, or you need more time, or what have you. Or you have issues around requirements documents. Which requirements are you going to shoot for? Um, um, you're, you're arguing for partnership share in a, in a firm that you're contributing to, a small startup. And you want to make sure that the, the partnership reflects uh, your your contributions, um, or office space. You know, you're selling a company, you're joining a company, and you negotiate terms for joining. Um, so, common anti patterns or misconceptions about negotiation is that negotiation is basically a successful fight for dominance. It's best to hold cards close to the chest, and and that. You know, it's best to focus on each issue separately, one at a time, because otherwise it's overwhelming. Turns out that good negotiation is difficult. It involves complex interaction between many, many factors. Um, there's preferences which are often aren't stated. And, you know, we as, as humans often have emotional hooks. We really, we really can fixate on certain issues because we feel that it reflects that person's respect for us or or feeling of how we compare to someone else or what have you. And one of the issues with these emotional hooks is it's easy to get distracted by certain particular attributes and lose track of win-win <coughs> opportunities and to incompletely parse what are the preferences or the concerns <coughs> of this party I'm dealing with. Um, so this fixation on issues, it gets us into this type of tunnel vision that sometimes we're we're not really thinking creatively about, about what's possible. And good negotiation demands often really good creativity. Some of the best negotiators I, I know have been extremely creative in suggesting solutions that are win-win solutions. Um, and you can have over and under confidence. So some authors, and I recommend this author, um, uh, Thompson. He has a great book, uh, Heart and Mind and the Negotiator, which I, I really recommend. He identifies a number of major, what he calls major sins in <coughs> negotiation. Um, one of them is failing to win, to realize win-win opportunities, leaving money on the table that someone could have benefited from better than the current situation, um, but you ignored that opportunity. Or you've settled for too little. Maybe you've revealed, you, you intended to reveal your target price, but when asked 
by that person at the company you're negotiating with, you actually revealed your so-called reservation price, what you'd be willing to take. And they'd grab onto that and say, oh, okay, we can make that happen. And really, you were shooting for $20,000 higher than that. But you you feel now bound um, because you indicated that you'd, you'd be positively inclined for that amount. And you end up going in having sacrificed uh, a significant amount of salary. Or maybe you start the job even though you really want to take that vacation. You start the job sooner than you would have liked, and you've left that opportunity for um, a bit of travel on the, on the table. Um, another issue is people walk away from the table. They just say, I'm out of here. I can't take this. Um, I'm not going to, you know, you're not treating me with enough respect or what have you. You're not treating me uh, well um, in terms of the negotiation. And they walk away from terms that could have been favorable. Um, and then finally, and it's a real unfortunate thing when it happens, but it does happen sometimes. Um, you, you, actually, you actually end up settling for something that's worse than your alternatives. Um, and you negotiate and accept something that if you had come upon it you know, up front that that was going to be the terms, you would have said, no, this isn't worth it for me. But you're so involved by that point, you end up committing to it. Um, so there's a number of common strategies in or common stages in negotiation, sort of people trying to frame the issues up front to get you to think a certain way often, think in certain terms. Um, individuals exchanging information on their preferences and priorities, making counters, uh, offers and counter offers, and then working towards agreement by refining offers. Those are often strategies that you go through. And often you, you come into these early ones without really realizing that's what's going on. That they are working to sense your preferences. What do you really care about? Is it, is it cost? Is it title? You know, is it salary? Is it more title? Is it flexibility? Do you want, do you want the ability to work on a project for you know every one day a week? You can work on a project if you're choosing. Are you, are you really after flexible working hours? Do um, you want to work from a distance? These are all different things people might seek, and they're trying to read. Okay, what's important to you? What's important to you? Um, and sometimes uh, with very accomplished uh, negotiators or large firms, they may try to use these strategies to kind of frame it in your mind. So you're thinking down their particular narrow view about what's up for negotiation and what's not. And breaking out of that is sometimes really helpful to find an agreement that, that does work. Okay, so I want to introduce a couple of key concepts. I don't have time in this lecture, to say the least, to give a really thorough introduction. I can give you a glimpse of some of the issues and help um, help eliminate some misconceptions um, and, and introduce a few key concepts. And, and three of these concepts are right here. I want to distinguish between a target price. What's what are you? What would be the ideal sort of situation that you're th uh, thinking? It's it's often determined termed in, 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 in phrased in terms of price, that you're shooting for like a certain salary. But it may be more than that. It may be that you'd like a salary and start date that would allow you to go on vacation for that dream you've been taking of going to Europe or something, but also get you uh, a decent salary. So it's a combination of things. Um, and maybe it's a, it's a set of possibilities there. But this is what you're shooting for. You don't know if it's possible, but you'd like to, to, to make it possible. Now, in addition to having that in mind, which you should, you should have a best alternative to the negotiated agreement in mind. This is a fallback. If this doesn't work out, let's suppose this negotiation with Vendasta um, doesn't pan out, or with Sextel. Um, what's my fallback? What do I have to fall back on? And often it's really favorable if you can get a couple of these. You know, if, if you're anticipating Make it, you know, you'd really like to go to Vendasta. Talk with a few other firms and see if you can get some offers. See if you can get some understanding of what they could offer you. This is, these are alternatives that you'll have in your pocket and that would provide you a lower bound for what you might take from Vendasta. They'd be something you could put on the table and say, look, you know, um, uh, I already have something that's much more favorable than that. 
I'm not going to I'm not going to consider that that offer seriously. I have something already in hand that that can give you a certain um, a confidence <coughs> in the negotiation at, at key stages and being able to tell them that may cause them to rethink what what they'd be willing to offer you. Um, uh, another key key concept though is to is to distinguish target price from reservation price, and this is generally based on the BATNA, the best alternative to the negotiated agreement. What's the minimum conditions or price over which you're willing to accept the offer versus walk away? You know, if Vendasta isn't willing to give you more than you know this amount of money. Um, um, or, or that amount of flexibility, is that a situation where you might be willing to walk away and, you know, go, uh, go instead to, uh, to another, another firm? Often these are probabilistic things. Um, I don't have time to go into that here. Um, so the idea with this win-win situation is, is um, in contrast, the idea of negotiation is something where you dominate and you win over somebody. The issue here is that typically you're negotiating multiple issues at a time. I listed some earlier. When you start, your title, yes, your your salary, maybe parking uh, privileges, maybe it's in, in terms of your ability to work from home a lot, maybe it's in terms of part-time work or we're taking some of your time in developing this project that you've been working on for a while. Um, Generally, we can get win-win because we have multiple issues, not just one issue to negotiate, not just price. I want more, they want, you know, for my salary, I want higher, they want lower. If it all came down to that, it, a lot of it would be a tussle um, over who dominates and wins out over the other. But instead, we have these multiple preferences. And the deal is here, and this is one of the, this is maybe the most important single point of this lecture. There are certain things that you may care about a lot, which they're very insensitive to. And things that they care about a lot that you're quite insensitive to. And because of that, there's give. Because of that, you may be willing to give out on some things and them on others, and you end up in a situation where both is extremely happy. So maybe for them, getting you you know, a designated parking spot. I mean, that's that's really easy. Or giving you two extra weeks off. Oh, well, that's when the company retreat is anyway. So sure, you you, you want to take a month off? Sure, no problem. Um, means a lot to you. Maybe really to them, it's 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 barely a loss at all. Um, maybe the person who be training you is really busy training someone else, so they say sure, defer it by another month. That'll be that'll be great be a lot less headache in my mind. So, so one of the reasons we can get win-win is because we have multiple issues and differences in the risk preferences regarding these different issues. Different how much I care about these things versus you care about. Um, and you know, you want to avoid this assumption that people have incompatible interests. We're just at loggerheads and, and bashing our heads against each other. We we want to get over this notion that one person's win is another's loss. No, you're looking for those things where I get the things I really care about, you get the things you you care about, um, and things we both care about a lot, we meet somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, so, you know, here here are some of the things I've, I've worked with some extraordinary <coughs> negotiators, um, uh, and. You know, far from being caught up just in the dollars, they got caught up in, in all types of things. I remember one colleague of mine um, traveled a lot internationally. And uh, he would spend, you know, two weeks at a time at hotels worldwide. Um, he had certain places he would go a lot. He'd be there and back. Remember one place, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, he was there, he'd be there, and then two months later, he'd be back again for three weeks. And then, you know, three months later for a month at a time. So there were an awful lot. And um, every time he had to renegotiate hotel, where he was going to stay, you know, plan his route to get to, uh, to, winter, to where he had to go, etc. And he decided this is for the birds. He doesn't, 
You don't want to have to every time go through this hassle. Every time end up in a different place, different rate. Um, and he also was there enough. He wanted he wanted some way to to have a sense of permanence there. So maybe he could bring a set of clothes and leave them there. Or maybe maybe he could have so he, he had a bad back and he he um, did a lot of work on <coughs> treadmills and, and so on for, for exercise. Um, and uh, and he found that it was just much more convenient if he didn't have to you know, get dressed, go down every day to the uh, fitness center, etc. So basically what he ended up doing is he, he went to some of his favorite hotels there and he said, look, I'd like to make a deal with you. I'm here, you know, three months out of the year on average, four months out of the year. Um, you can get a lot out of me in terms of payment, but I want a good rate and I want to be able to store the things I need in my room. I want to be able to, between times I'm here, I want to store my my equipment, my fitness equipment. And it turns out he was a he was a inveterate Coke drinker. He loved Coke. Okay, so he he liked to buy large quantities of Coke back home, um, and uh, he like he wanted to be able to store them. And so he went to different hotels and. Um, he talked with them. One of his favorites said, okay, sure, we'll make it happen for you. Here's the rate. And basically, they had a room that they rented out to people who worked for the hotel, or didn't rent it out. People, for, they were a chain hotel, um, you know, uh, Marriott or something like that. And so people would come from other Marriott's to visit, to review things. And basically, they put him in that room. They allowed him to store his stuff in the closet. The other people who stayed in the room didn't care. Okay, there's a bunch of coke in the closet and, and, a, and, a, and a treadmill. Okay, that's that's just the way it is. And he had a great deal. You know, he could wake up every day. His exercise machine was right there. He didn't have to wait for someone to get off of the treadmill in the fitness center. His coke was there. He could leave things, could leave clothes or whatever between times. It was a great deal for him. Win-win. They got their customer on an ongoing basis. Good, you know, decent price. He, he got great flexibility and he was wi willing to give pay a little bit more for that. Win-win. Win-win. Um, known other people in the technology space who have ended up with um, negotiating location. They wanted to have a location to be able to walk easily to work. <coughs> so that's you know as important to them as their what they're working on or their title or what have you. Or they want to be able to um, <coughs> Again, okay, take that time on vacation. Um, uh, they wanted to be able to work on a project on the side. And so they end up negotiating these things, and it's not just a salary thing, it's not just start date and salary and title, it's these things as well, and it ends up being very, um, uh, very, uh, very effective in terms of uh, being able to negotiate different, different parties. So common differences between parties include preferences, risk tolerance. Like, you may be very confident you're going to do well on this project. The company that's hiring you, they don't know you that well. They're not as sure. So maybe you're willing perfectly to deal with a, a contingent contract where you get paid a lot if it's a successful delivery on time. You benefit a lot. You're very confident, so you don't worry much about it. For them, it shields them from risk because if you don't deliver on time, they'll pay you a lot less. So they feel, well, we don't know her and her skills that much, um, uh, but if it doesn't work out, we pay less anyway, so we're willing to take her on. For you, you're very clear, very confident, and, and you feel it's a great deal. For them, it shielded them from the risk that otherwise would, would make them hesitant to pay you, you know, uh, agree to pay you up front a, a great, um, you know, a very, very good salary or what have you. So risk tolerance differs, time preferences, how soon they need you or not, how soon you need to start. Um, uh, expectation of, of outcomes, uh, resources that they have. Um, maybe they don't have an office uh, for you easily, but maybe you're working remotely would work really well with that and it would allow you to start sooner so you could start repaying off those student loans or something. Ability to undertake tasks. Um, 
maybe easier for you to do some things than for them or vice versa. Um, so really, um, much of negotiation is about this identifying of win-win conditions, and it requires thinking outside the box. Adding issues in often, things that I care about that you've never thought of as the company, or vice versa. Um, uh, and unbundling what's a single issue, like salary, more or less, into several issues. Um, maybe it's salary in first year versus salary in later years, and salary in first year is contingent. It's based on deliver, delivery, for example. Um, uh, another component of this, which is a great strategy, is actually coming up. The term package deal has bad connotations in English, because it sounds like it's take it or leave it, there's this package, um, you don't get any choice, and y you either get the whole thing or not at all. But here we're talking about multiple package deals. One of the ways I can express my preferences and say, look, I'd be equally happy starting late with this, this salary, and you know this this terms in the contract involving my um, uh, my responsibilities, or I'd be equally happy starting early with this higher salary and this other this other component. Putting up several package deals, maybe one of them they say, okay, we can't talk about those others because those are not aligned with our needs. But this one now we're getting close enough. Let's start to try to refine it. Let's use that as a basis for. For you know further further refinement. Um, uh, also, you should be asking, what are their preferences? Like, what do they care a lot about? Do they care about your start date? Do they care about your title? Do they care about you know the uh, the terms with which um, you're going to be working with one group or another? Um, are they concerned about certain things risk-wise that you're not concerned? If you can get a different, a sense of these differences and preferences, then you can potentially achieve a win-win. And I mentioned this notion of a contingent contract, a contingency contract. If, if X happens, then I get paid this, otherwise that. Or if X happens, then you know the next stage of the work will be of this sort and, and otherwise uh, that. So think about delivering a software project for a client. And you're a new company, you haven't had many clients, you're very confident you can do it soon, and so you might say, okay, if we can deliver by this date, which you're very confident about, because you have this library already written, you've done it once for another customer and you're convinced this is gonna be bang on. They don't know, they're not technologists, and they say, well, you know, uh, how do we know you're gonna do it on time? We're concerned you'll go over, and you say, well, okay, if we deliver this package by this date, you pay us uh, this larger amount, if it takes to this date, it's a lesser amount. Again, shields shields risk um, lets you reap um, good benefits if you're confident of delivery. Um, of delivery. So the idea here with package deals is to present several alternatives. Say I'd be equally happy, or you know, each of these would be good for me. Three, four package deals. You basically say, is this package? I'm happy with this one, this one, this one. This helps communicate your preferences to them. And it's constructive because they actually get several options, which is attractive, right? If it's just one option, they might feel, well, are we really communicating? You know, um, if it's several options, there's much better chance that they might they might find one of them palatable, palatable, you know, something that they like. Um, a further thing is you might be thinking of several options anyways, so you're trying to come up with one option, you go through several alternatives which you might be equally com comfortable with, just package them up, remember them, and, and communicate them together as, as, as alternatives. And that will increase um, the likelihood of a good match. It will also speed up the negotiation because you're, you know, you're quickly allowing them to sort of uh, <coughs> proceed towards identifying something of, of common interest. So faster convergence gives information about preferences on both sides, gives a perception of flexibility. Sometimes with negotiation, there could be a concern that I'm seen as not flexible because I'm not <coughs> willing to you know, consider this or this. Presenting several packages gives a demonstration of a certain amount of flexibility. 
do this, 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 etc. Um, and it can help you overcome a certain hesitancy that many of us carry towards, you know, conceding one thing. Well, you're not conceding on one thing except getting better on another. So it, it helps overcome that, that aversion. You can help find a rough proposal. Let's say this is in the ballpark. Let's, let's try to see um, if we can do this. And, you know, can show respect for people of different viewpoints and, and the other party, which is often important that, that the other party wants to feel you're, you're respecting them. Okay, in terms of communication, part of, of um, the, I'm not going to say the art of the deal, um, part, part of the, uh, part of the, um, the s uh, successful strategy of getting to a, uh, a well, successful negotiation, part of a good strategy for getting to negotiation is to realize that communication there's some things that should be communicated readily and some things which you shouldn't communicate that readily. So holding your cards to, close to your chest is not always desirable, okay? Not sharing info on preferences particularly can hurt you. They need to know what you care about because that's what allows them to craft something which will speak to your needs. If, if you're holding that, you're really shortchanging yourself in terms of getting getting them to, to offer something that's desirable. So the most important factor to communicate is, is priorities, okay? Priorities, preferences. What do I care about a lot? What do you care about a lot? Um, and often providing some information gives, leads to reciprocation. They are willing to, to give some. What you don't want to reveal, you absolutely don't want to reveal is your reservation price or your bad number. And, <coughs> A very common rookie mistake that happens is you have in mind, perhaps, a target <coughs> price that you're looking for, a target deal. And they ask, what, what, do you, what would you be willing to do this for? And you end up giving your reservation <coughs> price. You, you end up saying something that's quite a bit lower before you realize it. And then they say, oh, is that all it takes? Okay, we can make that happen. And you've just left a lot of possibilities <coughs> on the table. You've walked away from a much better potential deal. Um, uh, so you don't want to be in a situation giving out your reservation price, particularly not as if it's your target. You can give out a target price. I really like the salary of X. Um, but, but don't give out your, your reservation price and don't give out your best alternatives to negotiate agreement. Don't say, I, I would urge you to be very cautious about saying, well, you know, you already offered me already a salary of 45K. Um, what do you think they're going to end up offering you? 46, 47, 45, 45 with a parking spot, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Um, right? There, that, that gives a sense of your reservation price, where you, you'll walk away if they don't meet that. And so they're not going to go lower, but they're sure not going to go that higher. If you say, look, I already have an offer larger than that, higher than that, um, you know, they're not going to know what it is, and that's going to cause them to potentially offer you some, something higher. Um, you know, higher yet than if you just revealed, revealed uh, what it is. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to be careful to make information clear to the party. Preferences, for example. Sometimes people don't realize it, but the other party is, is not uh, clear about, about the idea here. So what do you want to do is, you, you know, if you think about negotiations, there's this notion of Pareto optimality associated with them. The issue, you know, maybe on some, um, uh, Maybe this is person one and person two here on the two axes. So party one, party two. This is you in terms of what you'd like to see, perhaps, um, and, and this is uh, what they'd like to see. And there's going to be some trade-offs. I mean, you'd like more, perhaps, on some things that they'd like less. But what you don't want to do is and you want to end up in a situation where you couldn't improve things with, for one person without loss for the other party. You don't want to be in a situation where one party is getting needlessly 
sort of poor results because without any loss on my part, we could make you happier. And this is notion of Pareto optimality, which basically uh, says you're on the efficient frontier, where the only way that I could be made more pleased if, is if you're less pleased. But there's a lot of things in life where there can be agreements being considered where it could be improved for you without losing preference for me. Maybe I don't care that much about when you start during the summer because a lot of my key trainers are away. For you, it would make a big difference. And I want you to start when you want to start. So you're pleased with it. I don't lose anything significance. Um, for me, it's a wash. Okay. Um, so uh, a few tips and then we'll break here. We'll have to stop. Um, prepare. See ahead of time if you can get a sense of the other party's batman. They're trying to hire you. Who else are they trying to hire? What are their other options? Are you the only game in town? Um, uh, the only one who has these skills? Or are there lots of people with these uh, with these skills that they're, that they're dealing with? Um, you know, how quickly do they need that person? Do they really have other people in the wings? And then identify your best alternative to the negotiated agreement. What, what's your fallback? Can you develop that? Can you go and cultivate more badness by getting quotes from others so that you, you actually have more to go on in terms of good badness when you're negotiating this one you'd really like to work out? And you want to be clear about your, what your reservation point is. Under what conditions you would say, yeah. Um, uh, and what's your target that you'll, you'll give to them? Often you want a target that has some basis for it. You don't <laughs> want to just say, I want to earn whatever. You, you, you want to be able to point to some evidence. Maybe it's a market survey about what software engineers earn you know, at this point. Or you want to be able to say, look, there's three people I know who, who you know, had salaries above this within the past year. You, you want some objective thing you can point to so they don't think you're just pulling it out of a hat for your target price. But don't tell them your, your reservation price. You can tell them your target, yeah, I'd really like the salary, <coughs> this. And it's quite high, but have some reason for, for saying. Um, uh, and you know, listen for the preferences and the concerns of the other party. What are they sensitive to? What are they not so sensitive to? Because often those provide the key for successful negotiation. Um, and then you're seeking improved badness on an ongoing basis. While this negotiation is being on, if you can get one more offer from ESTI or if you could get something you know, from Zoo that would come in here, that could be used in the negotiation process. They say, look, I've just gotten another offer, um, a very attractive offer. Uh, I'd really like to bring this negotiation home, but I am tempted there. Let's see if we can, you know, can, can bring this home. Um, so you want to avoid taking the process personally, have it be us versus them. They're trying to screw me over. Um, uh, share information about preferences, priorities. Want to get some objective <coughs> basis for position. Without an impersonal criteria, they can think it's just personal <coughs> preference and arbitrary demands from you. You want something you can point to that gives you uh, a basis. Don't confuse your target and reservation price. Target, you say, reservation, you keep to yourself. Discuss multiple issues, not just, not just salary, but, but multiple things. Understand who's sensitive to what risk, who's less sensitive to what risk. Um, and you know, formal exposure to some of these ideas are good, but it takes a lot of experience to go through negotiations separately to get you uh, really effective on this. And, and I have a slide of sort of some tips from um, the Thompson book as to sort of what you should be thinking about in terms of self-assessment, assessment of the other party, and assessment of the situation. Um, turns out there's a really interesting science behind risk preferences. It's extremely interesting stuff. We don't have time to, to hit on it. Um, I'll include the slides there. You can look at them. There's some real fascinating analytics. But it, relates to the fact that, look, people pay for insurance, even though on average they lose money, they pay to shield themselves from risks, which would be, which would be catastrophic. People are not risk neutral. Often it is worth us to pay something to avoid certain risks. 
pay on average to avoid certain risks because if those risks happen, it's highly disadvantageous to us. So it's actually worth it uh, for us to pay on average money for this. And this has to do with preference functions, et cetera. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much. I will, um, as normal, be holding office hours uh, today. And, uh, if, uh, and I will look forward to seeing you at the latest on Tuesday for the guest lecture at the lecture spot and for my lecture at the story. Thank you very much. Good luck with your projects.